Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. But there's no need for a trigger warning on this episode, although I might cuss a bit. This one is about the pop culture phenomena that was spawned by the Peterson case. I'm going beyond the documentary, The Staircase, to other documentaries, the 24-hour news cycle, several books, podcasts, think pieces, and so on. The only warning you need here is for spoilers. The HBO Max series premiered almost a year ago, so no whining. Have y'all missed me? Because I sure missed you. Now on with the show. In December of 2010, French filmmaker Jean-Xavier de Lestrade had no idea what was coming. A few months earlier in September, he had attended the premiere of his first documentary called murder on a Sunday morning. In it, Lestrade covered the case of Brenton Butler, a black teen who was wrongfully accused of murder in Jacksonville, Florida. Already, Lestrade's documentary was receiving rave reviews. There were rumblings that he had a real shot at an Oscar next spring. The seasoned director wasn't getting his hopes up, though. He preferred to focus on his work. Of course, Lestrade did believe his documentary was good, and he was ready to make another one. But this time, he wanted a different true crime story. The exact opposite true crime story. Not a black teen, but a white man. Established, wealthy. Someone prepared to pay handsomely for the best criminal defense lawyer money could buy. And that someone would be the now infamous Michael Peterson. Finally, welcome to episode 176, the pop culture of the Michael Peterson case. One note before we start, I apologize if I mispronounce any French names. I've also seen the director referred to as De Lestrade instead of just Lestrade in print, but not audio, so I'm going with brevity, dude. Jean-Xavier De Lestrade did win the Best Documentary Academy Award for Murder on a Sunday Morning in March of 2002. It was his ninth feature film. And by March, Lestrade was not sitting on his laurels. He had already chosen his next subject and had already begun filming. He searched over 300 criminal cases before he and his producing partner, Dennis Ponset, found what they thought was the perfect one. 58-year-old Michael Ivor Peterson. Lestrade was the executive producer for the whole series and Ponset on a few episodes. But co-producer Allison Lukchak, or Luckchak, was the one actually tasked with scouring the American criminal dockets for the perfect case. And then after the staircase team chose Peterson, she had the enormous responsibility of fostering trust not only with Michael's team, but with the judge and prosecution, all with a newborn baby. I'll discuss her important role more when we get to the HBO series. She is officially credited with producing two episodes of the original eight, but suffice it to say her role was much larger. Editor Scott Stevenson edited five of the original eight episodes, along with Sophie Brunette, who worked on the whole series. Brunette's involvement later caused scandal, because she and Michael were later involved in a 13-year romantic relationship. But the relationship did not begin until after he was convicted, and Sophie began writing to him in prison, which means she did not know him personally during the first eight episodes. She only saw him in the tapes. Again, I'll get into her part more with the HBO series, because all of the people I just mentioned had huge issues with how the HBO producer writing team used their source material. But let's start with the Staircase documentary, because arguably, we wouldn't be here now without it. A Vietnam War veteran turned novelist accused of murdering his wife in their 10,000 square foot mansion in an old southern city already sounds like the blurb on the back of a great paperback mystery. The mansion was already a bit famous in its own right. It was used as the commander's house in the original The Handmaid's Tale movie, which premiered in March of 1990, two years before Michael and Kathleen moved in with their kids in 92. As I told you, Michael's first wife, Patty, had initially refused to divorce Michael. She finally signed the papers in the fall of 96, and in June of 97, 
Kathleen Hunt Atwater floated down the grand front spiral staircase to become Kathleen Peterson. This was not the staircase she died on. That was the narrow back staircase, originally used for servants in the five-bedroom, six-bath mansion that was built in 1940. It is a very beautiful house. You can see why the filmmakers chose it. With its white columns, balconies, intricate details inside and out, not to mention the gorgeous pool area, it definitely looks like the home of someone powerful, like Alfred's commander in The Handmaid's Tale. Sorry, I could wax poetic about this house, the film, and especially the book for hours. Margaret Atwood is my favorite author. You may have noticed I use quotes from her often in my cold opens. I wrote three college papers on this book alone. Anyway, while 1810 Cedar Street may have simply been home to the Big Peterson clan, to the rest of Durham, it is what we see, an incredibly beautiful, majestic southern mansion. And it would be the home base of Lestrade's documentary. The new film was called Suspicions in French and The Staircase in English. Filming began almost immediately after Michael's indictment in late December of 2001. Lestrade was captivated by Michael's case. He liked that it was unclear. While Michael seemed sincere, he also felt secretive. Did Michael kill Kathleen? Lestrade was intrigued. As he started looking into the case, considering it for his documentary, he met with the Durham District Attorneys, Jim Harden and Freda Black. And according to Lestrade, within the first 15 minutes of the conversation, Harden and Black asserted one very clear sentiment. Michael Peterson was evil. Lestrade was taken aback because the prosecuting attorneys didn't just professionally believe Michael was guilty. They were personally certain, and not because of their case evidence, but because of their gut instinct about Michael's character. In their eyes, there was no question that Michael had killed Kathleen, and he deserved to be punished. Lestrade also captured the media hysteria around Michael's case through the eyes of Michael, David Rudolph and team, and also his children. It's not like they had any choice in this media circus. Equally, Margaret would later point out, the kids didn't have any choice in the documentary. Michael chose for the whole family. Not that they would have refused. They worshipped their father, which is also a huge part of the narrative of the staircase. Could this man, whose family stood so fiercely behind him, have killed their mother. For over a decade, Lestrade's team chronicled Michael Peterson's case. With over 800 hours of material, Lestrade transitioned his standalone documentary film into an episodic series. There was simply too much to cover, and by the end of it, Lestrade realized that he had no conclusion for Michael's case. He didn't know if Michael was guilty of murdering Kathleen. That is why he did not intend to telegraph to the audience whether or not he believed in Michael's innocence. But one thing Lestrade did feel certain of, the district attorney's hate for Michael stemmed from his bisexuality. Many years after his groundbreaking docuseries, The Staircase, came out, the French director would explain, when the prosecution discovered that he was cheating on her with men, in a way, he betrayed their community, their values. It was much more about who he was and where he was living than anything else. Or maybe, as Michael told his team emphatically in the documentary, this is Durham, it's dirty, it's corrupt, it's small. Or maybe it was an even broader cultural problem, as Rudolph's jury consultant said on camera, this is not California, not New York, this is the South. We Southerners may not appreciate that generalization, but the fact is, the South is comprised of conservative red states. Remember, when Michael was convicted, same-sex marriage was still illegal in North Carolina, not to mention sodomy was not decriminalized until 2005. His sexuality was literally against the law. I don't think it's fair to say the jurors were not at least unconsciously biased against Michael after Freda Black's aggressively homophobic trial conduct. One juror told a BBC podcast that they were not swayed by his sexuality. 
Maybe Freda's over-the-top performance turned them off, and they did ignore it. But they were also still Southern jurors in a state where it was against the law. And Michael Peterson was presented as a man cheating on his lovely wife, who was also a pillar of their community. Michael won one of his appeals early on about information found in his computer. His sexuality should never have been presented as evidence. But it's not like the leaks had not already done the damage. You cannot put the cat back in the bag, so to speak. But here's the thing. We can say it was Durham, or it was the South, but it was also intrinsically American. The Peterson case was always going to be famous. People obsessed over it the way we have recently over the Murtaugh case. Or even O.J. Simpson, which is a more even comparison considering the time frame, though Peterson had not reached O.J.'s level of fame, obviously. The Murtaugh case happened in the age of social media, but O.J. Simpson literally ushered in the age of the 24-hour news cycle beginning in 1994. I admit I was obsessed. I had been a longtime lover of true crime by then. I've often told you that my mama let me watch those movies of the week or miniseries based on true crimes back in the 80s. I watched Fatal Vision with her, and then she took me to buy the book. I watched The Burning Bed with her and discovered Anne Rule. Ironically, she often chewed my dad out for letting me watch horror films. And to this day, I love horror films and books too. Also to this day, I search YouTube for those old TV movies. They are like comfort food to me in the way some of you fall asleep to forensic files. So by the time I was 20 years old and O.J. Simpson dominated the airwaves and the headlines, I was married for the first time and in college. Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman were murdered two days after I got married while I was on my honeymoon. A year and a half later, I watched every minute of the trial. I recorded it on my VCR if I was in class or at work. And when the verdict was announced, I think it was my first real brush with injustice. It felt like a punch to the gut. And if you think he's innocent, you're a few years late to come yell at me about it. I covered that case in a joint episode with the Trashy Divorces podcast. It's in my feed if you are interested. Two years later, I was up studying in the middle of the night listening to MSNBC, the newly minted 24-hour cable channel, when news of Princess Diana's car accident broke. By the time Kathleen Peterson died, the 24-hour news cycle was as much a part of our lives as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are today. The talking heads covered the case gavel to gavel, as it was on court TV before it ever became a documentary. One of the loudest talking heads, as usual, was Nancy Grace. She shows up in the staircase, speculating that Michael must have changed his shirts at one point. That's the kind of speculative journalism that is irresponsible. There was no evidence that Michael changed his shirts. Absence of evidence is not evidence. Meaning, because there were no bloodstains on Michael's shirt does not mean that he changed shirts. If he was going to do that, Why not change his shorts? Those did have bloodstains. Or get rid of his shoes and socks. It's absurd. There is another on-air correspondent who was talking to Nancy Grace that pisses David Rudolph off so badly, he appears to call in a favor to the network to complain about her. He basically says he expects this of Nancy, but this correspondent named Jean, who was answering Nancy's questions about the supposed footprints in Luminol, saying something like, We have to assume his bloody footprints were cleaned up at this point. That wasn't said in court. No one suggested it. Rudolph's point was that this woman sat through the trial and should be correcting Nancy. But let's face it, who corrects Nancy Grace on air and lives to tell about it? But back to my earlier point, Michael's sexuality, or adultery as some just saw it, was already a huge part of the story. In the documentary, Rudolph says, it's coming in, we have to face it. But on the subject of the press, Lestrade also shows how David Rudolph works the press corps outside of the courthouse. We see Rudolph and Harden spar over who is the one actually creating the media circus, and I've said before, I believe we tend to expect defense attorneys to use the press, 
but we don't always see the prosecution so blatantly try their case in the media the way Durham prosecutors did. Leaking autopsy results weeks before it was supposed to have been completed is just one example. There are many more that I've already covered. But it's interesting to watch Rudolph. He walks a tightrope of being righteous and also having to brush off rude questions while remaining amiable. It is worth noting that after Michael's trial in 2007, who David Rudolph remarried, he went through a divorce during the trial and began a relationship with a journalist named Sonia Pfeiffer. They are still together today. They are now partners in his law firm and also have a podcast of their own called Abuse of Power. They use their platform to educate people about flaws in our justice system. Candace Samparini testified angrily about Pfeiffer. Apparently, she interviewed Candace under the guise of being sympathetic and implying she believed Michael was guilty. Candace didn't know she was seeing David Rudolph, of course. Then, Pfeiffer told Candace she believed Kathleen did fall down the stairs. Candace called this journalism misconduct in court. Allegedly, Michael was also angry when he found out about the relationship. I doubt Rudolph's relationship did any harm to Michael's trial. The press in general did. But how would Rudolph really make that a part of his argument without seeming hypocritical? I missed seeing David Rudolph speak last year at CrimeCon, but I also missed Henry Lee and John Ramsey and other people I had really wanted to see. I love being on Podcast Row, but I swear this year, I am going to make time to see a few speakers. Speaking of CrimeCon and Nancy Grace, I've met her. She is the classic and on-air personalities in that she's nothing like she is on TV. She is tiny and sweet and gracious and truly a delight to meet in person. But watching her on TV, I usually want to strangle her. Interesting side note, since this is a pop culture episode, if you've seen the movie Gone Girl, you'll notice there is a Nancy Grace type TV journalist who makes the husband's life miserable. Then when the wife shows up and the husband, played with irony by Ben Affleck, is proven innocent, she's all hugs and kisses, let's be friends now. I thought it was a great character, and now having met Nancy, I love those scenes in Gone Girl even more. It's nothing personal, she tells him, just business. Nancy Grace is basically playing a character. I don't think any of us hate her for her coverage of Tot Mom, otherwise known as Casey Anthony, but otherwise, let's just say she's not everyone's cup of tea. And I think her persona is exactly why her fans love her. Sorry for the sidebar here, pun intended, but I thought it would be fun to talk about Nancy not only in her coverage of the Peterson case, but as a pop culture icon. But back to the 24-hour news cycle. It is safe to say Rudolph not only knew how to handle the press, but could often make it work in his favor. Not every journalist covering the case was a Nancy Grace type. And frankly, by the end of the case, serious legal pundits truly felt it would be a hung jury, if not an acquittal. Most professionals didn't believe the state had proven their case. If anything, they had ended up with egg on their face with the discovery of the blowpoke. But the jury isn't made up of professionals. It's made up of everyday men and women. So the professionals were shocked. The public at large was probably split in how it felt, depending on where they were from. From what I can tell, Locals overwhelmingly believed he was guilty. Some have come to change their minds, but many have told me that they couldn't even stand to watch the staircase. They had it in their faces too much at the time and had no interest. I don't blame them. Local cases like that are exhausting when you live there. The original eight-episode staircase premiered in the fall of 2004 in the UK and on the Sundance Channel in America in April 2005 and it was a fairly niche endeavor. The Sundance Channel was not what it is today, but the docu-series was very respected and won a Peabody Award. And when I say niche, or niche, potato, potato, it's true. It was not mainstream entertainment the way documentaries are now, but it was a cult classic for true crime buffs. Margaret Ratliff said the only time she was recognized before the documentary went on Netflix was when the family took a skiing trip to Denmark. 
The staircase was the only thing in English playing on the TVs at their hotel, so every morning the family was stared at when they went down for breakfast. And then, in 2018, Netflix bought the staircase, and Margaret's life went upside down. All the kids felt that way, and each dealt with it in their own ways. Suddenly, the small documentary was available worldwide to 180 million viewers. Martha buried herself in her work. Caitlin Atwater and Clayton Peterson did the same. All three are very private. As I said, Todd Peterson remained active on social media and seemed to turn on his father, but I think he's been quiet for a couple of years now. Margaret was in the film world by then. She wanted to be a documentarian and said that the staircase cost her a job with Netflix when they found out that she was that Margaret Ratliff. She goes by Margie these days, and I'll discuss her more later when we talk about her new documentary. But back to the staircase. As I and many reviewers have said, Lestrade attempts to be unbiased but doesn't always succeed. Like when Michael takes the Alfred plea and the judge orders his immediate release. The director comes out from behind the camera and hugs Michael. When asked about this, Lestrade explained that he was happy for Michael, but he does understand how that can make the docuseries appear biased. I think it's to his credit, though, that he left that bit in. He easily could have cut it out. But Lestrade also pointed out that the Staircase docuseries appeared biased because neither the prosecution nor Kathleen's family would work with him. To this, Lestrade said, it's difficult to be an objective observer, especially when the other side doesn't want to participate. And to that point, I will agree and counter with Diane Fanning's book, Written in Blood. I have read countless true crime books in my life, and I would say it's very rare for a book to come off so strongly against the accused within the very first pages. Fanning obviously hates Peterson, she calls his crying while his dead wife is still lying on the floor, caterwauling. She even seems hostile to Todd Peterson right off the bat. Now, obviously, true crime books are going to have a point of view. Hell, I have a point of view, often to my detriment in my iTunes reviews. Some people think podcasting should just be a just-the-facts-ma'am exercise. And to those boring folks, I say read Wikipedia and be done with it. I have no interest in hearing or reading about a case where the writers have no opinion. So I make the show I want to listen to. Having said that, Fanning makes no effort to at least begin the book with a little mystery. She wants you to know straight off that she thinks Michael is guilty. And not just guilty, despicable. She cannot stand him. Much like the prosecution. After I read her book, there was a lot from it that could have been some very juicy background in my episodes if I want to decide it. But here's the thing. First of all, it's difficult to trust everything she wrote. I'll give you some examples, but just in general, if she cannot hide her hate for Michael even in the beginning, it's hard to see how she could be objective. And journalistically, she wasn't objective. She only talked to the prosecution Kathleen's sisters, and Elizabeth Ratliff's sisters, who by then had completely turned on Michael. And fair enough, that is certainly their right. But the problem is, the stories they told Fanning and that she then repeated in her book are extremely inflammatory and hurtful to Margaret and Martha. They have never publicly confirmed these tales about themselves as children and as teens growing up with Michael. I can't help but think of my own aunts. I don't care what the situation was. They would never tell such private and hurtful stories about me. The Ratliff aunts did it in their hatred for Michael, evidently without any concern for the nieces they supposedly loved. When I was working on the background episode, I was aware of Margaret and Martha's feelings about the fictionalized HBO show. Margaret's work on that new documentary about people who appear in documentaries is even more telling. The point is, those stories are extremely personal and what's more painful, whether they are true or not, whether they are exaggerations or not, so I chose not to share them. There are some other odd problems in the book that I noticed. 
Things like what Candace must have told Fanning that didn't match what we see her do on screen in the staircase. Mainly about Kathleen's grave. Also, she and Lori are in at least one episode, so they did participate some. There are also scenes from the courtroom that don't seem to match what we found in our research. And scenes that are certainly colored by her opinion. Like, she will think the defense has messed up when it was actually a point they just won. Sometimes it's just little things, but enough to make you wonder. Obviously, you can read the book for yourself and decide. Those are just my thoughts, and I rarely give them about other people's work. Speaking of, I listened to a BBC podcast called Beyond Reasonable Doubt about the Peterson case that was published in September 2017. I thought that it looked professional. It's long form, much more long form than what we are used to with some 20 episodes, and features interviews in every episode from different people associated with the case. One of those is a local Durham journalist nicknamed Gaspo. I think that should have been my first red flag. They also tout Diane Fanning as the ultimate Peterson case expert. First of all, the host of that show and his crew ambushed Michael at his home after he declined an interview. He said he had been told about the podcast and listened to the first few episodes and felt it was unfairly one-sided. He was especially pissed about Fanning being deemed the expert on his case. And he has a point. She didn't talk to the defense. She did not talk to his children. She didn't talk to him. How is she an expert, as this show keeps calling her, if she won't look at both sides? He also took issue with her calling him a narcissist and a psychopath. To his knowledge, she didn't hold any higher degrees in psychiatry or psychology, he intoned. And he's for sure got a point there. But back to that ambush. He had declined through his lawyer after checking out the first episodes. He didn't just give a plain no, and he did not ignore the request. Michael is not only reasonable, I think it's fair to say he enjoys some of the attention. He's given many interviews over the years. But he felt the podcast was unfairly biased against him. So why would he agree to participate? I don't blame him. And then he and his family did choose to participate in a Dateline episode, which made this BBC podcaster feel that Peterson now owed him an interview. So he asked again. He again received a polite decline. So he showed up at Michael's apartment. That's some tacky tabloid journalism, if anything, and Michael was pissed. But as angry as he was, he calmed down and agreed to an interview, but not right there on the spot not being blindsided. He scheduled it for the next day so he would have time to listen to the rest of the episodes. And he had the same criticism. The podcast interviews only people from the prosecution and Kathleen's family. The host did point out that David Rudolph, Michael's attorney, talked to them. But as Michael said, they portrayed him as this slimy defense attorney, a showman, he is repeatedly called, not the very respected trial lawyer he is, and then cut off a lot of what he was saying. I could spend the next 10 minutes listing David Rudolph's accomplishments, and he doesn't even get a full episode on this show. And in the episode devoted to Dwayne Deaver, I thought, finally, we'll hear some fair reporting. They acknowledged the problems, but pretty much gave the last word to Nancy Grace, of all people, who declared Dwayne Deaver's actions irrelevant. The jury had originally said they found Deaver's testimony the most compelling. It was his testimony about his own experiments that supposedly proved premeditation. He used that old string test you see on TV. Dexter does it a lot. I think it's useful in gun-related deaths, but I can't see how you can prove it in a fall or alleged attack without a weapon. See what I mean? They needed a weapon to make this make sense. Anyway, Deaver used points in midair, where he said Michael raised the blowpoke and then struck Kathleen. Years later, criminologists testified that this was absurd. You don't find points of origin in the air like that, unless you are talking about a gun. Now the juror who was interviewed by the BBC backed away from Deaver, insisting he didn't sway the jury much. She said it was all that blood. To give Diane Fanning her due, 
She did say that the jury was biased about Michael's sexuality. She came from the South and called it the old world. She said his idea of an open marriage would not be accepted in their society. Now, she didn't say biased, but just gave it as a reason. But then, she called the French documentary team biased and said she spoke to a few jurors and insisted they said his sexuality did not matter to them. So I guess she was just acknowledging that the jury was inherently biased against his lifestyle because of their worldview in the South. The jury spoke to the press together after the verdict and said it was the physical evidence, not the Ratliff evidence or Michael's sexuality, that convinced them. Tom Maher, part of Rudolph's team, said that while they may not have officially deliberated about Ratliff or the gay stuff, as everyone kept calling it, the jury was tainted by these issues. But one juror admitted that she did think about the Ratliff evidence. Ann Pennington said, quote, I wondered how the same thing happened repeatedly. So I'm thinking it did have a bearing in my mind, but this wasn't the decision the jurors made. Another male juror kind of chuckled and said they weren't there for the Ratliff case. The BBC podcast did play Michael's short words outside the courthouse after he was released before setting up the next episode entitled Alfred Schmalford, after what Candace Samparini famously called the Alfred plea Michael took. They couldn't have telegraphed their bias more clearly. The reason I decided to call out this podcast specifically, because it certainly wasn't the only biased one, is because of how they ambushed Michael. When defendants are in the midst of a trial, they are used to the press camped out on streets near their homes and by the courthouse. Should they jump a man 15 years after his case went to trial? He served eight years and took an Alfred plea. He served his time as far as the justice system is concerned, even if others don't agree. He doesn't owe anyone an interview, and even if he does give interviews to other outlets, that still doesn't mean he is required to say yes to every interview. Certainly not to ones he knows are biased against him. He was a 75-year-old man trying to walk from his car to his apartment door. What kind of shit is that? I guess if you think he is guilty, which this podcast most certainly posits, then it's open season on him, right? Wrong. I don't personally know any podcasters who would behave this way. And I've been at this for over five years. I have true crime podcaster friends all over this country and other parts of the world. None of us operate this way. We do not believe it's ethical. You contact your subject through proper channels. Either they will or they won't talk to you, and you take that decision and move on. I think this speaks to a larger issue of journalism and podcasting. Let's face it, we are only starting to become mainstream. And even now, most of the time it's to make fun of us. Side note, one of the reasons I loved the show Poker Face is how it made the true crime podcaster a heroine. Sorry, spoiler alert, but that show ended over a month ago, so no crying. After Michael's conviction, Lestrade sent the first eight episodes of The Staircase to Michael's attorney, David Rudolph. Rudolph needed to review them before their publication. He had to ensure that no information that came out in the documentary would hurt Michael's appeals. As per Lestrade, nothing about the documentary was changed, not one single sentence. And while I can see why people believe it is biased towards Michael's innocence, I don't really feel that way myself. I think Lestrade showed things about Michael that he didn't have to and that did not make Michael look innocent. In one scene in the documentary, Michael's reaction to finding out about a man named Dennis Rowe is particularly interesting to me. Because he seems like he's lying. Dennis Rowe is the gay man who gave a statement to the prosecution saying he had sex with Michael Peterson a few times, but who the prosecution never called to testify. Lots of people think Michael seemed like a liar in the documentary. That's fine. I go back and forth. I do think you can tell small lies and not be a murderer. And that's what this felt like. He did not want to be associated with Dennis Rowe for whatever reason. His laugh is overdone at this part, whereas he feels much more genuine 
and other parts on the same topic of his sexuality. You're shitting me, he exclaims in a high, false-sounding voice, nothing like his softer, more measured way of speaking on camera. And it's not that he doesn't usually curse. He does all the time. I would wager that Michael's favorite cuss word is the F word. No, it's the sound of his voice here, somewhat strangled and caught off guard, a secret he didn't think would get out. And in the end, it didn't, except in the documentary. The prosecution did not call Dennis Rowe to testify. There is speculation that Rowe had relationships with many prominent Durham men, and that's why he was dropped. It's definitely the reason given in the HBO series, though we have no way of knowing if that's true. But it's interesting in light of the fact that people accuse Lestrade of being biased. He simply could have had his editor cut this part out once Roe was not called to testify. Lestrade gave reasons about things he left out of the documentary, like the owl theory, for instance. He said he didn't include it because it was not brought up in court. He said he only used the evidence that was used against Michael at trial. So if that's the case, he could have cut the Dennis Rowe scene, but he didn't. I think it shows he thinks Michael lies too, and he wanted his film to capture it. And if an HBO behind-the-scenes episode is to be believed, Michael was hiding something that he eventually admitted to Lestrade. Put that in your back pocket, because it's pretty explosive. And also, sorry if I've confused you about the owl theory. I know there is a very short episode that addresses it now on Netflix, but that was tacked on after the theory gained such popularity on social media and then in the press. Lestrade never wanted to use it before, but I guess by popular demand, he threw us the scraps of an episode that is literally only three minutes long. There are a few more things I want to talk about concerning the documentary before we move on. One is that the prosecution and judge did originally agree to participate with Lestrade and crew. They changed their minds pretty quickly, but there are early interviews with Harden and Freda Black. Basically, they are talking about their argument to get Michael's sexuality included as evidence. It appears that Lestrade never got an interview with Judge Hudson. One reason why is that the prosecution intended to subpoena the tapes as discovery. The filmmakers did not want their work used against Michael. In order to avoid turning over the tapes, they shipped them overnight after every day of filming. They would have been doing this anyway, as editor Sophie Brunette and Scott Stevenson both remained in France. But now it was imperative that the tapes did not get into the prosecution's hands, so they shipped them overnight daily. And there was some participation from the family that is arguably more substantial than the short interviews Harden and Black gave. The scene I mentioned where Lori and Candace go to Kathleen's grave is one. And also, the cameras follow them when they go to Duke University to scour writings that Michael had donated, as many published authors do for their alma maters. They were looking for references to death and violence. They also joked that his sexuality should have been obvious. But one scene in the documentary really stands out. There was a cameraman who rode with investigator Art Holland to go and film the exhumation of Elizabeth Ratliff's body. Now, we know that Hardin decided to exhume Ratliff only a few weeks before trial. It seems like it would have been long after the prosecution decided not to participate. And yet, they let this staircase cameraman along for the ride? Interestingly, Holland gave a little talk about how the prosecution had learned of Michael's alleged hot temper particularly after talking to Ratliff's family. One can only assume that these are the same stories the Ratliff sisters gave Diane Fanning. But again, neither one of them testified for the prosecution. If Michael was so bad, if they really believed he was this horrible man with a murderous temper, why didn't they testify? Because it's difficult to believe they didn't to spare their niece's feelings when they did tell Fanning these stories. It's curious to me that Durham prosecutors gave the staircase team this access, like they approved of documenting the exhumation. Maybe to try and show their side was being completely open and on the up and up about this grisly endeavor. Maybe if their M.E. hadn't done the autopsy, 
It may have looked that way. I told you I felt that the BBC podcast was problematic for a few reasons, and I have felt strange breaking the code and naming the podcast, but it felt silly to play coy. It would have been worse to talk about all of the podcasts I listen to. It's against the rules in my Facebook group, but I had to go with my gut on this. There were too many podcasts to ignore this category altogether. And this one had the best examples and interviews. One interview they scored was with a juror, Kelly Colgan. She felt that Rudolph was trying to weave a web, as she put it, to draw her in, but respected how Jim Harden didn't try to use emotion, only fact. She chose to ignore Freda Black's histrionics, I guess. She also said that finding out that Dwayne Deaver's behavior in other trials is what got Michael a new trial was disappointing. Ma'am, it wasn't his behavior in other trials. He lied in Michael's trial. He conducted discredited experiments after lying about his experience and how many experiments he had ever actually conducted, which was three the last one 11 years before his experiments for Michael's trial. He also said he had been to something like 15 falls. He had never even been to one. He also conducted a test on Michael's shirt that he either failed to give to the prosecution or they hid it. Either way, it's a Brady violation. There was no blood on his shirt, by the way. Whether or not you believe in Michael's innocence, it drives me nuts when people say he got off on a technicality. If that was your life hanging in the balance, I think it would feel more substantial than a paperwork issue. And this was before all the other details came out later, like Deborah Radish changing her ruling in the autopsy, and the fact that the blow poke had been logged and photographed in the original search, but that photo went mysteriously missing until new legislation was passed and David Rudolph was given pretty much the entire file from the prosecution, and he found it. The blowpoke was not mysteriously missing, as the prosecution kept hammering during the trial, but the damn photo was. But back to juror Kelly Colgan. She said she didn't need a blood spatter expert, and then the host wraps up her interview, saying Kelly is clear that it wasn't the Ratliff evidence, it wasn't Michael's bisexuality, it was the blood evidence that swayed the jury. Then how did Dwayne Deaver not matter? And the jury as a whole was interviewed right after the trial and said that Deaver's testimony was important in their deliberations. And you can see in court, they are riveted when watching him, even if the rest of us are falling asleep or trying to keep our eyeballs in our heads. Kelly is the same juror who accused Ron Jarrett of staring at the jury menacingly trying to intimidate them. I mentioned this in part three, and it's absurd. Jarrett was Rudolph's investigator and trial consultant and was watching the jury to see how they responded to different witnesses. I promise, I am almost done with this podcast thing, but one last thing. Jim Harden was interviewed extensively and still defended Dwayne Deaver. He also called David Rudolph the epitome of the zealous advocate as if that's a bad thing, before saying, quote, he and I have a very different idea about the rules of professional conduct and how one complies with those, and that's probably all I should say, end quote. That's rich, considering how Hardin conducted himself during Peterson's trial, or I guess how you could say he let Freda do the wet work and break the rules of professional conduct. It's still his trial and it was his office officially hiding evidence. Jim Harden was a good old boy with Durham connections. David Rudolph might have been a well-paid, high-profile attorney, but no one could argue that he had any sort of questionable connections in Durham the way we know that Harden did. And the prosecution leaked so much to the press that I felt one of Rudolph's only real mistakes was not asking for a change in venue. But the final thing about this whole podcast is that it premiered before we found out the extent of the corruption in Jim Harden's office and the Durham PD. Before we knew that Deborah Radish changed her opinion. Before we knew that Harden and Black made Brady violations in withholding evidence. 
it would be nice to hear this podcast and a few others go back now and revisit the case, knowing what we know now. The BBC podcast came out after the Deaver scandal, and they still were not fair. So I guess that's my problem. You don't have to like Michael Peterson. You are welcome to still argue his guilt. But anyone still defending Dwayne Deaver at this point should be ashamed of themselves. And I will say that it's possible that most people on Michael's team refuse to be interviewed. But I don't think so. Why wouldn't the host defend the team and say they were asked when Michael complained it was one-sided? And Deaver, by then, was working at a drugstore for nine bucks an hour after his fall from grace, when he should have been sitting in a jail cell for all the lives he ruined in his 18-year career at the SBI. There is a funny scene in the HBO series when Michael is finally out awaiting his new trial and goes into a Walgreens and Dwayne Deaver is working the register when he checks out. The two men just stare at each other. Deaver did work a minimum wage job after he was fired, but he also fought back, suing the SBI for his job and back wages. The courts found he should have just gotten a demotion and a 10% wage decrease for what he did and ordered the SBI to pay 34 weeks of back wages, but said they were right to fire him for the perjury. It's insane to me that he got paid for that. There are a few articles that place him in Texas per LinkedIn, but he's gone private now. But I've sidetracked again. There were no podcasts or think pieces, Dateline and 2020 episodes, until after the Alfred plea and Netflix picked up the staircase. There was Diane Fanning's book and Aphrodite Jones, which I didn't read. I understand it was also pro-guilt, but less detailed, so I decided not to. But Michael said she did visit him in prison and agreed that a book would be one-sided if the author only talked to one side. I did, however, read Michael's book, Behind the Staircase. I had thought I would skim the book and was surprised to be drawn in. He writes about his childhood, some experiences in the military, and the bulk of the rest of it is about his time in prison. I hate war books and only read prison books for research but this one didn't feel like research. I do think he obviously embellished parts. I don't think the Italian mafia was looking to protect him once he got inside. But other parts do ring true. I do think people liked him, and not just for clout. He went out of his way to be helpful and kind to others. I have to say I believe him on that. As an elderly man in prison, he had to be careful. You can get thrown in the hole or solitary for keeping your own bottle of ibuprofen in your cell. And he admitted that he hated teaching and helping people get their GEDs. Most ex-cons will say that was a rewarding experience, but he didn't bullshit about it. I appreciate that candor. He does have a very lyrical way of writing, and I can see how he got book deals. I'm not sure if I doubted this or just felt uninterested because they're war books, but I did get sucked in and read his book in a day. It made me sheepishly feel like a book snob. It wasn't high literature, but he kept me interested. I appreciated how he spoke of Kathleen. He didn't try to make her a saint. There was no doubt she was a good person, but he didn't deify her. In fact, he surprised me by comparing her to Sophie Brunette, the French editor of The Staircase that he had a 13-year relationship with. First of all, yes, he wrote about Sophie and their relationship. It wasn't a secret, as some people have implied. She began writing to him about a month after he went to Nash Correctional Prison. They were a meeting of intellectual minds. She sent him literature, highbrow stuff like Proust and Voltaire. And this is where he compared her to Kathleen. Kathleen definitely wasn't into Proust. She was into math. She was raucous. She was blunt and funny and could have a confrontational personality. Sophie was all softness. He was adamant that they were intellectual equals. Kathleen was a brilliant engineer, after all. They were just complete opposites in personality types. I liked this characterization of both women. People often say Kathleen isn't humanized in much of the media surrounding the case, but some of the funny stories he told 
about his brash, spitfire of a wife are more humanizing than things her family told Diane Fanning about her. She sounds hilarious and brave. She hated sexist men, complaining often about the men she worked with. She sounds like someone I'd want to have a drink with. She definitely sounds like someone you would want to know socially or as a neighbor. Not only kind and generous, but genuinely fun. Sophie Brunette was and is beautiful in looks and soft in personality. She is not in the Staircase documentary, obviously, and I think the HBO Max series does her a huge disservice. Sophie said of her character on HBO, quote, Despite Juliette Binoche's wonderful acting, I look rather crazy, manipulative, stupid, and pathetic, she told Variety. I have to agree. She is a shrew by the final episode, and that's not at all how Michael saw her. Michael wrote about Sophie, describing her as my only real friend in prison, the only one I confided in and revealed my fears to. She was definitely his life preserver, as he called her, and she took care of him when he was out awaiting retrial. Remember, he wore an ankle monitor for almost three years. Michael doesn't write too much about the trial or even the people involved very much. I told you before that he actually wrote about what he thought David Rudolph's mistakes were. The big one being that he said it was a fall. Instead of just relying on reasonable doubt, once he said there was a fall, he had to prove it. But as I said before, Rudolph was too good an attorney to not give an alternate story. Whether or not it's legally required, it's what juries need. Michael may have written more about his trial and appeals in his second book, Beyond the Staircase. I admit I didn't read this one. I skimmed a bit and realized he was revisiting his prison time and put it down. I did read a review later that said he included four chapters of a fiction novel in the middle of the book before discussing his first book, the documentary, and a few other things anything that was not to do with his current private life. But there is another new book out that I can't wait to tell you about. It's a whole book about the owl theory. I have to tell you, I like the owl theory a lot, but I didn't always. I used to roll my eyes when people mentioned it. But even before I read the book, Death by Talons by Teddy Smith, I really came around to the theory in my own research. To me, it explains what has always been unexplainable in Kathleen's death. If it was a beating, why wasn't her skull fractured, or at least some serious contusions or hematomas on her brain? There was no traumatic brain injury. I think it's more likely to not have those injuries in a fall. You can pop your head against the corner of a door frame and get blood gushing from your scalp. There's no one saying, much less any proof, that Kathleen would have fallen from the top of the staircase, which would obviously cause more damage. But she just fell on the last few stairs. I've probably mentioned this before, but I am a huge klutz. As I'm writing this, I just cussed out the plantation blinds in my living room for yet another cut and bruise because I walked by too close. My husband just calmly asked if I was bleeding. He's used to it. I have fallen more times than I care to admit, especially on stairs. We just moved, and my old house was a year older than the Petersons' house. I had a dark, narrow staircase with the exact kind of landing the Petersons had. I recorded the first episode of this series as the last episode in my old studio, and superstitiously, I swear, as I left, I just knew I was going to fall down those stairs. I was in the house by myself. I had my hands full. We do stupid shit like this all the time. And I know better. But we do it out of habit. Just like jogging upstairs in flip-flops. I used to joke about how many times I had fallen up the stairs. And we all know headwinds bleed worse than other surface-level cuts. It's astonishing how much blood can come from banging your head on a surface. I should know. I once bent down to pick up my dog's water bowl and popped up, oblivious to the corner of the kitchen counter it was under, and knocked myself sideways. I yelled for help, more mad than hurt, but it looked like a crime scene. My problem with the theory of a fall in the Peterson case 
has always been the wounds on Kathleen's head. I do think you can hit your head once and the skin will split like that, but I have trouble believing it would happen twice. It's two perfect trident marks, like the three claws of a bird of prey. And there is the beginning of a third mark on the left side of her scalp, like the owl tried to latch on but missed, and then tried again, and that's when the two perfect tridents were made, when the owl clutched onto Kathleen's head and did not let go. Also, all the small scratches on her face and around her arms and hands, Smith felt like they came from the owl's beak fighting with Kathleen in a death grip. I'll put the photo of Kathleen's scalp in the Facebook group, but not wide on social media. I don't feel that's appropriate, but it's easy to find if you're not in the group, and it's on the link I'll provide in show notes. And I admit, I am not 100% certain I could see how this happened if I had not watched that Dateline episode that actually showed an owl attack as well as the fictionalized HBO series, which definitely shows it as a possibility, which, I know, I know, it's fiction. But when you can see a possibility along with what happened to the guy on Dateline, it doesn't seem so silly. I am going to post a video with all three scenarios in my Facebook group. Even though these will be the fictional reenactments of three theories, I still don't think it's appropriate to put it across social media, but it is on YouTube too. Initially, I thought Titty Smith's book, Death by Talons, would be another skim read for me. I do have to speed read or skim and research sometimes. I thought it would be too much conspiracy theory and not enough substance. Nope, he did an amazing job. Smith, who is from New Zealand, watched every minute of court once it was up on YouTube. He poured over appeals. He researched owl attacks. He researched falls and beatings. It is really well done. First off, he acknowledged how maligned Larry Pollard was. I think we are all so familiar with the owl theory that we don't really remember or know how ridiculed this man was publicly over this idea he raised. He brought it to David Rudolph right before closing arguments, so it was too late. Rudolph now believes in the owl theory and said if he had gone back to trial again, he would have used it in Michael's defense. If you don't know or remember, Pollard was the Peterson's next door neighbor. Not neighbors like most of us have because their properties were so large, but still their closest neighbor. He was a hunter and he understood birds of prey, but particularly barred owls, B-A-R-R-E-D, not barn owls, which nested in the trees on their properties. He felt Michael was innocent but it's not like they were best friends, just good neighbors. He was sad, but life goes on, until he saw the photos of Kathleen's scalp, the wounds he came to be certain were caused by an owl's talons. In his book, Smith printed several headlines, most from the Durham Herald Sun and one from Raleigh News and Observer, making fun of Larry Pollard and former congressman Nick Galifianakis who he teamed up with trying to get someone to listen about the owl theory. Galifianakis was a professor at Duke at the time, and it was always Larry's passion about the theory that led the charge. Nick just tried to help boost the signal. Imagine the moxie it takes to get up every morning, read those headlines, and still not let it go. Imagine the fortitude and belief in yourself to face that and keep going. For someone who is not family, or even a close friend. But Pollard is a lawyer and believes strongly that an injustice happened in this case because it was an owl attack. That's why he won't let it go. Titty Smith heartily agrees. His theory is summarized in one sentence. Michael was railroaded. He believes that the police and DA had already considered an owl attack and purposely hid evidence of feathers at the scene. He thinks that someone in charge simply said, get rid of them. They felt in their gut that this was a murder, and the owl feathers would just give fuel to the defense. His proof? He says you can see owl feathers in the video the police made at the scene. He asks, why would they begin filming outside and walk through that way if not to document the blood drops and feathers? He also notes something I don't think anyone else caught. There is a break in the video. 
They stopped filming and then began again. If you do that with official evidence, you are supposed to log why. It was never questioned. And he made a really good point that I myself danced around when discussing the evidence. But I never thought to emphasize it the way he did. I complained that the crime scene technicians did not collect the towels under Kathleen's head, or the paper towels, or her flip-flops, or Michael's glasses. In court, they gave the lame excuse that the glasses didn't have blood on them. I thought it was just really messy crime scene work, and I guess it still can be. Titty Smith thinks there is a more nefarious reason. If they collected that evidence, they would have to test it, and would likely have found evidence of an owl. Whether it would be feathers or DNA, if they ran a test, they would find it. The police did not collect one thing around Kathleen's body. They took stuff from all over the house, silly things from rooms that had nothing to do with her death. They took Todd's clothes along with Michael's, even though he showed up at the scene in front of paramedics. But they didn't take any of the objects directly around Kathleen that I just listed. All of the sudden, that doesn't feel messy or lazy. It feels purposeful. And the original photographer, Angie Powell, who was a bit green at the time, agrees with Smith, calling it Forensics 101. She said it had to be deliberate. Smith says if you analyze frames of that video, you can see the feathers. I would suggest going to the Wild Blue Press website and look at the photos. I'll have that link in my show notes. And we will also have some photos on my website. Smith even thinks there was a feather on Kathleen's ear visible in the video. He also said that there are white droppings on the bottom of the stairs and landing that are never explained, and that it's what's called mutes, or bird droppings, or frankly, bird shit. And if you look at the photos, you can see it. I think I always assumed it was where Candace had tried to clean up. I meant to mention that in an earlier episode, but it was kind of disputed, so I let it go at the time. She gave Diane Fanning an emotional story about trying to clean up her sister's blood before her mother arrived. She said she was scrubbing with a sponge and saw red tinted water dripping down her arm and realized it was her sister's blood. She got sick and stopped. Her story was disputed by the Peterson's longtime housekeeper who said that Candace ordered her to clean up the blood, and she refused. I think both can be true. Candace tried, stopped, and then told the housekeeper to clean it up. But it certainly poses a problem for anyone trying to conduct scientific tests in that area afterwards. It had been released by police, but the defense had not yet had a chance to look at it. When they got to the house, they boarded up that stairwell to protect it. But maybe... The damage was already done. But anyway, I'm not going to re-argue this case like that. At this point, I don't really believe you can prove what happened to Kathleen by studying the blood spatter. I did my best in other episodes to explain what experts believe and who I thought was the most credible. It's not Dwayne Deaver is all I'm going to say about that now. But one thing that bothers me is Smith reports that D.A. Jim Harden refused to meet with Larry Pollard. He publicly said the theory was absurd, that there was absolutely no evidence to support any owl attack. I guess he is ignoring the over 50 hairs from her own head clutched in Kathleen's hands with pine needles, and he refused to look at the microscopic bird feathers found in those hairs, even though the evidence log from the scene did include one feather. The prosecution never tried to explain this. Hardin further said of the theory, It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. But apparently, his office did agree to meet with Larry Pollard, and Harden ducked out a back door as he came in to set up. That's cowardly and rude, if he agreed to the meeting. And I guess he didn't want to think of the possibility that he got it wrong. He'd already hidden evidence. Why should he entertain any other alternate theories? A trial should be about finding the truth. But we know it's really about who tells the better story. And Jim Harden was not about to mess with his win. Speaking of alternate theories, Titty Smith acknowledges all of them. Though he doesn't believe this was a fall because of all of the owl evidence, he studied the statistics and said, quote, 
a fall is six times more likely than a homicide, which is kind of what I said when I told you how common they are, but Smith put it much better than I did. Another alternate theory Smith provides that also made me smack the side of my head is that what if Michael got blackout drunk? We know basically from what Kathleen's talk screen showed that she was not really drunk, tipsy maybe, and on Valium. But did Michael finish both bottles of wine and champagne and then go to bed? There was something else I missed in the original episodes. Michael told the paramedics and the first people on scene something like he came down to turn off the pool lights and found Kathleen. After that, he changed his story and then told the exact same story and never wavered. They were both drinking down by the pool. He stayed out there while she came in, and then he found her. Why the two stories? I meant to put it in because it's a point in the guilty column simply by possibly being a lie. I promise it was not intentional. At the time, I remember thinking maybe they misunderstood Michael, that he had said something about the pool lights, like he stayed down there and then turned everything off and came in. Since he never changed his story again, it didn't seem too important, and I completely forgot. My apologies. Smith posits that Kathleen didn't drink much because of her conference call the next day, but Michael, celebrating the film option of his book, finished the wine and champagne by himself. Now, I also know drinkers. They have a tolerance. So I didn't think much of it. But champagne can sneak up even on daily wine drinkers. Smith thinks he went to bed before Kathleen, and then he woke up at around 3 a.m., thirsty as hell with the beginnings of a hangover. So he decides to go down and get a drink of water and make sure the pool lights were turned off. And then he found Kathleen. But Michael is smart, and he thinks on his feet. As Smith put it, quote, I cannot remember what happened throughout most of the night of my wife's death is perhaps the worst alibi imaginable. That's true. But it explains the timeline, that Kathleen may have actually lain there for a couple of hours before being found. Remember the debated red neurons? Maybe he had even kicked off those shoes before he went to bed and that's why they were off. I don't know. But I know another possibility. There is no one angrier than a blackout drunk. If Smith is going to theorize about a blackout night for Michael, who then innocently changed the story because he didn't think the police would believe him, then we do have to consider the opposite. That he got in a fight with his wife when he was blackout drunk. Maybe shoved her in the stairwell and then went to bed. Then he woke up and found her, remembering pieces of what happened, and tries to help her. I still believe that if Michael did kill his wife, it was not premeditated and therefore not first-degree murder. I think the towels and paper towels around her were his genuine effort to try and help her. That's probably one of my biggest irks with the prosecution. They got the theory of the case all wrong. I could go on and on about the owl theory and particularly about this book. I read it in one sitting on my phone with a copy the publisher provided me. Oh, and I have to say this. I wish his name was Teddy Smith instead of Teddy Smith with two Ds. I don't necessarily snicker when recording or writing, but I'll need to mark this explicit just for his name alone. I hate saying that about someone's name, but I know people will hear a different meaning in that word. But moving on, I've got several copies of his book, Death by Talons, that I'm going to give away in my Facebook group and on Patreon. I don't want you to think it's a cheap ploy to get you to Patreon, so I am going to make that a giveaway for people who have already been patrons. But you still have a chance if you join the group. I also found some really cool owl rings online. It's not like they were crazy expensive. They are just a little bit of trinket for the owl theory enthusiasts. And hey, before I forget, speaking of things I forgot to tell you in prior episodes, I meant to follow up on that black cat poster I told you about in episode two of this series, the Shat Noir poster that was framed and hung in the stairwell. In court, one of the Germany friends talked about how they recognized this poster, and it was so eerie because Liz had the exact same one and how twisted it was 
that Michael put it in the staircase or something, really trying hard to make this as villainous as possible. There are some really dumb parts in this trial. Rudolph had the witness pull the Peterson print out of the frame and show it was a reprint done in 1997 that Kathleen had purchased. It had nothing to do with Liz. It's a really popular poster. Can you imagine wasting time on this stuff in court? They needed a stricter judge. But anyway, I didn't want to welch on my promise to explain that poster. I guess it's pop culture too if you think about it. I should have said fictional shows just then, but I didn't want to confuse you. Or you may remember I told you there is a sitcom based on this case. It's called Trial and Error, and I am going to hell without even a handbasket to write in because I did laugh. In my defense, John Lithgow plays the Michael Peterson character for crying out loud. He is always hilarious to me. The true crime mockumentary, as IndieWire dubbed it, came out in March 2017, even before The Staircase was on Netflix, which was June 2018. The writers had seen the documentary and just got the idea. The second season was based on Robert Durst, or the Jinx documentary on HBO. I think it's a bit more tasteful because it has Kristen Chenoweth playing the filthy rich Robert Durst character. She has killed her husband, much like Durst is suspected of killing his wife. It's funny, but not nearly as much on the nose. I was surprised a second season got picked up. I guess on the power of Lithgow alone, because it's not like now when everyone watched The Staircase and would get all the first season's jokes. But season two came out in July 2018, right after Netflix bought The Staircase. Still, I bet they were kicking themselves for not waiting a year for the first season. And season one is uncomfortably close. Like, I sincerely hope none of the family members have seen it. They even named his late wife Margaret, which is so dumb, except it's fun to hear Lithgow say her name over and over. I don't know. Like I said, I did laugh at parts, but it was honestly a bit too absurdist comedy for my taste. I don't think I would have laughed if I wasn't in on the joke. But maybe, because Lithgow, damn it, I love that guy. But anyway, there were only two seasons. They are on Amazon Prime if you're interested and a seat next to me in hell. So now let's get to the big kahuna. The reason I actually got interested in covering Peterson in the first place, the HBO fictionalized version of The Staircase. It's not like the original documentary didn't have its detractors. One big issue people always have is Kathleen is objectified. She is a murder victim in a pool of her own blood, or magnified to horrific proportions in court props. She is not the vibrant, loving person that we have learned about through other mediums. And HBO definitely wants to remedy that deficit. Tony Collette plays the Kathleen character. It doesn't feel right to say Collette plays Kathleen because it also doesn't feel right to call Kathleen a character, which all the actors do in their behind-the-scenes bits. For the most part, they remove themselves from the real people and talk about their characters in interviews. While she is this dynamic loving woman, she is mainly played as thoroughly stressed out by money, by her never ending responsibilities to the children and to her husband, who is a man child. She plays it bitter. Colin Firth plays Michael, and I have thoughts. This feels like blasphemy, but Colin did not convey Michael's charm. I know many of you find him to be insufferable, but many others found him very charming. He's the clueless dad who tells the same story over and over and goes on too long, who walks around with a pipe quoting Shakespeare. He might be pretentious, but he's witty and had a sense of humor. Even Candace admitted that and found him entertaining. But his portrayal in the documentary is something Candace Samperini had a huge problem with once they were back in court for the retrial, and she got to make another impact statement. She was pissed. She thought inappropriately Michael joked around too much, and she said he threatened her and Caitlin. I do remember Michael saying what a bitch about her once, and does she ever shut up. But he was on trial and got heated about some things she said. It was just talk. Let me be clear. 
I don't blame her. You don't blame her. And in the end, Michael did not blame her. In his book, he felt badly for her. He understood her wrath. He thought if someone had murdered one of his siblings, he would have reacted the same way. What he said in the documentary, and has often said since, is that the way Candace has held on to her anger and hatred is unhealthy. He told his kids that despite his conviction, he didn't want that for them. I respect that, and I feel the same way for her. Her anger and pain is palpable. I want that poor woman to find peace. She's given interviews to Dateline saying she felt catharsis after the Alfred plea and said something similar on that BBC podcast. But she doesn't sound better. She sounds bitter. I feel like Kathleen would want her to be happy and move on with her life. I know I would if my sister was in that purgatory of pain because of me. She is played brilliantly by Rosemary DeWitt in the series. One thing the series does that I really do not like is go back and forth in timelines with little warning or notification. Sometimes we are just supposed to figure it out by how gray Michael's hair is or which bed he wakes up in. Playing with timelines and points of view is a trope of thrillers in novels and in film. It's always been around in some form, but it feels like it's gotten so much more popular over the last decade or so. Every novelist wanted to write the next Gone Girl. And for that matter, every director wanted to make the next Gone Girl film. But it doesn't work here. It's too jarring. I think they could have cut back and forth more judiciously, and it would have worked fine. Now, it's just irritating to be in one scene and then pulled out to a different year and different place with no warning. I think their point is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It did work with Candace's victim impact speeches. Her hairstyle is different enough that you know what they're doing, and it is powerful. But back to Colin Firth. I told you in one episode that a director told him to watch the documentary or do his own research and decide if Michael was innocent or guilty and play him that way. I'm going to guess he went for guilty, for many reasons, but also, he's really just written that way. They also go out of their way to portray him as a bully. In one scene, when his brother talks about needing to fly home for a bit, and Michael argues that he needs him, the brother says those magic fighting words, it's not all about you. It is all about me, Michael roars. He's on trial for his life, and until it's over, it's about him. Perhaps this is a Michael that people saw off camera, but it's not what we ever saw. There is also a particularly cruel scene later in the series when the family goes to a Mexican restaurant after Michael has been released to await his new trial. He is so grouchy and mean to his children that Todd, played by Patrick Schwarzenegger, orders a double tequila shot after having been sober for a few months. So this series is pretty much saying that he drove his sober son to drinking. He had been pissed at Todd for a while, because Todd once forgot to put money in his commissary account in prison. Todd had always been the golden boy, the favorite. Clayton is the fuck-up, as they put it. And frankly, he was a fuck-up. We know he spent time in prison for what Michael just wanted to blithely call college pranks. But he has changed by this time. His dad is in prison, and he puts the commissary deposits on auto withdrawal in his account. Now, Clayton is the golden boy, and Todd is out in the cold. Michael barely looks at him. I don't remember this from Michael's book. Maybe I forgot or missed something, but I certainly don't remember him bad-mouthing any of his children. At this same dinner, he calls Margaret Margie the Martyr. Not for the first time in this series, either. Again, I don't remember that from Diane Fanning's book, either. I do wonder if this Todd stuff is related to how he went off the rails on social media, as I told you. He turned on his dad. And to me, in the videos I saw, he did seem like he was on something, or drinking. And there's plenty of partying with Todd and Clayton in the series as well. But even though Clayton is the one with the past, it's Todd we see doing coke and drinking to blackouts. But no one connected to HBO would have been at that Mexican restaurant 
or told anyone about it. It's all fiction. And I would say it's damaging. In my worldview of true crime cases being fictionalized, it's the dialogue they are supposed to be imagining, or they are cutting and combining characters or scenes for time. What showrunners Maggie Kahn and Antonio Campos have done here is use a pattern and then cut it to pieces on the wrong kind of cloth. As great as Tony Collette is, we really don't see much of Kathleen's reported warmth, her intelligence. We see stress and her temper and exhaustion. And while Kathleen was arguably going through a lot at the time, no one has characterized her that way. In the series, if anything, this Kathleen is cold, especially to her sister. Candace has publicly said that Kathleen wasn't just her sister, but also her best friend. I was left feeling there was competitiveness bordering on jealousy between the sisters after Fanning's book. And that is definitely how the show played it, a really contentious relationship. Like maybe that's why Candace became such an advocate for her sister, because she felt bad about their adversarial relationship. That's my guess. Like I said, you get a sense of it in the book, but nothing like this. That Thanksgiving scene was complete fiction and it was really ugly. The only real warmth we see are in the scenes with her daughter, Caitlin. And later, Caitlin not only grieves for her mother, but her lost sisters once she gets on Kathleen's family's side and is separated from them forever, we are left to think. The show certainly mined a lot from the book written in blood. I haven't heard Diane Fanning say anything about it, but Michael has certainly complained. There are plenty of prison scenes they could only have gotten from his books, and they did not ask him permission or pay him. Which, technically, they didn't have to. If the whole series was based on Fanning or Peterson's book, then yes, they would pay. Campos did pay Jean-Xavier de Lestrade for the rights to the staircase. And not just the 13 episodes Lestrade produced, he handed over 800 hours of tapes he had to Antonio Campos. Lestrade said it was only 7,500 euros or $9,370, which Michael Peterson said made him a pimp. I'm not joking. He said he pimped out his family and used a lot of other colorful language blasting Lestrade and some emails to Variety. Lestrade pointed out that Michael's story was, quote, a public story. They did not need to buy the docu-rights to have Michael Peterson and his children as characters in the show. But, he added, I am terribly upset by what Antonio did to them. It is unfair. I understand why Michael is mad. I feel really sorry, but Michael is focusing on the wrong target. Michael did later calm down and focused his ire where it belonged, at Antonio Campos. You can't fabricate stories about living people the way he did when they are not public figures, he fumed. Well, yes, you can. As long as you say based on a true story or inspired by a true story. I could wax on about this for years because it's one of my passions. Obviously, as a true crime writer, I always want to see what creatives will do with these stories. I was dying to see The Staircase. I was obsessed with Ryan Murphy's American Crime Story on O.J. Simpson because I covered that case. And I am all for creative license, but this doesn't feel right. It's hurtful. I can see why Michael was angry at how his kids were portrayed. I can see why Margaret was so upset when she stumbled onto ads on Instagram. She's really the only one who has spoken out. And I can see why the documentary filmmakers were angry at how they were portrayed. Because that's the whole point. This meta idea of showing you the filming of the famous documentary while showing you the supposed real lives of the people in it and what led up to Kathleen's death. This all started when Campos reached out to Lerstrad to express his admiration for the staircase, as he told Vanity Fair. That was in 2011, when there were only 10 episodes. Campos had already been interested in making it into an independent film. Other studios were also looking at it. His point to Lestrade was, it was already in the public domain. And it was. But Lestrade thought, better the devil I know, I guess. 
He said, quote, since I know that Antonio had in mind to tell the story of Michael and the documentary, I thought it would be better to cooperate and be involved in the process than to stay totally outside as a stranger. In a way, I thought I was protecting Michael and his family by being involved, but I was wrong. And therein lies the rub for this show. Lestrade was credited as a co-executive producer on the show, but he was not consulted, he read no scripts, he was not paid, and he just trusted Campos. The two men would meet up for coffee from time to time when they were in the same country and call each other and email. I'm sure he feels embarrassed now that he was so naive. Yet, let's be honest, Antonio Campos had all the tapes, and we don't know what was on them. But I will wager it was not the Peterson kids screaming at each other like they do in the series. They were too well-behaved to have done that in front of company, much less on camera. Documentary filmmaker Don Porter told Variety, quote, The risk of allowing someone else to fictionalize your story is that you can't reclaim that narrative even if it's so clear that the fiction is false. Several people involved raised concerns that more people would see the HBO version and believe it as truth. I'm not so sure about that. Netflix is a giant, and The Staircase was long a cult classic. HBO will always be the elite cable giant, but it is still finding its footing on streaming. In my opinion of HBO, Mayor of Easttown beats The Staircase hands down. There's no comparison. And it is fiction, but it's crime writing and performing at its best. I think despite the star power of Colin Firth and Tony Collette, it is still a true crime niche show. People who liked the documentary will want to watch it, but I don't think it was appointment television the way Mayor of Easttown was. That show broke the servers on the finale. Rotten Tomatoes has the staircase at 92% with reviewers, but a 57% audience rating. Reviewers slobbered over it. They loved all the performances, with several singling out Parker Posey as Freda Black. She was uncanny. She didn't just look like her, she embodied her. She nailed that accent better than any other actor. Parker Posey is Freda in all her homophobic glory. She's funny and biting and congenial and outrageous. And the series is open about how Freda is used in court. She herself starts using that courtroom drawl about the porn in Michael's computer as they are brainstorming in Harden's office. Then Harden says, well, but we need more than just the Freda Black show. This part is fiction, but it's still wrong, or perhaps being ironic. Freda Black and Dwayne Deaver won that trial. In one scene, she is sitting at a table of men going over Michael's emails, and her southern pearl clutching is priceless. She asked what one of the words even meant. If you've still got kids in the room, cover their ears now, though I won't actually say the word, just the answer. B, e, two, one. The answer was cunnilingus on the other end. What's worse to Michael Peterson is Colin Firth seems to demonstrate this act to his surprised but aroused wife a few scenes later. This would be after he came home disappointed from a lost encounter with a man. The real Peterson found the sex scenes to be very offensive. He said he wasn't trolling the porn section at Blockbuster for hookups. And I believe him. He was more discreet. He also claims to have never watched it, but he clearly has. He knows exactly what to complain about. I've gotten off track a bit with some funny stuff, but I want to say I do appreciate what they wanted to do here, to explore the narrative of truth because it's meta. It's not just the Peterson story, it's also the story of the French filmmakers. Sometimes scenes are shot for shot with the documentary. It opens with a black title card with a quote from the Bible. I was born for this. I came into this world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. Truth, said Pilate, what is that? John, 1837. Oof, that is a heavy way to start a show, to quote Jesus and Pontius Pilate's speech about truth. But I guess that is the point. The showrunners played so heavily with the truth in this, 
it is like, what is truth? What is fiction? And all of the make-believe scenes only work because of the stellar cast. Sophie Turner, better known as Sansa from Game of Thrones, plays Margaret, and Odessa Young as the highly emotional Martha, a Brit and an Aussie, just like Firth and Colette. Patrick Schwarzenegger as Todd is so on the nose, it's freaky. Sometimes when I think about Todd, I see Patrick's face. They did not find a similar-looking young man to play Clayton, even though the men resemble each other in real life. And Peterson took issue with that, too. He was played by Dane DeHaan, whose good looks were dialed down. Michael mentions the bags under his eyes like he's a drug addict. I'm not sure what the point of that is. But I think they chose a good actor who didn't look like his real-life counterpart so much. But they did very much highlight bags under Kathleen's eyes, so maybe it was deliberate. I don't know. But aside from the actor Cullen Moss, whose hairdo did most of the work as Jim Harden, the actors were chosen for acting. While we are talking about the acting, we should talk about the stunts Tony Collette and her stunt double, Linda Kessler, did, who extensively researched the death scenes, of which there were three. Like I said, I will play them in my group, but not on open social media. You can either watch the series or search YouTube as well. I'll tell you where in the series. I will give you a spoiler alert here, because if you want to watch it for yourself, do that first, because I am going through these. The first one is the theory of the fall, that it was an accident. That is in episode two at about the 53 minute mark when she walks into the house yawning. You can hear the flip-flops clapping the floor. She yawns again so hard it made me yawn. The dread is horrific. She walks in to go read that email and then changes her mind and turns back around to the stairs. She then tries to jog up the first few steps in her flip-flops and trips, falling backwards, hitting her head on the edge of the doorway, smack on that sharp crown molding. She is knocked out for a moment and then wakes, stunned, and tries to sit up. She's pulling herself, and when she does sit up, the blood pours down her face. She coughs, gags and pulls herself to a sitting position and cries, Oh God, Michael, help me. Then she tries to stand in her own blood and falls again. And then we witness her have a sort of seizure and take her last breaths. Then we get David Rudolph's soft voice over the film talking about how Michael got towels, cleaned her face, and called 911. And then the film cuts to the war room at the Peterson house, with David's team and Michael sitting around the dining room table. The point is, this is now the official version of Kathleen's death they are going with. The second theory, better known as the murder theory, is shown in episode four at about the 57 minute mark. You do see her find emails and porn on the computer. I guess despite what the technician said in court, they went with this whole theory. She sits inside, waiting for Michael to come in, and says, I always knew, I think, somewhere underneath. What are you talking about, he says. I'm talking about the porn, the escorts, and the men, the men, the men. He tries to tell her she's drunk, and it's called research, but she tells him to stop lying. It's a fight, an ugly one. She tells him she's leaving him. As she gets angrier, he walks away from her, which makes it worse. She trails him, saying awful things in her hurt. You're nothing, she cries. He is the one walking up the stairs. She is following him up and shouting, I've given my whole life to a pathetic closet case. And then he turns around and yells, shut up, and pushes her. That's the first time she hits her head. Then he steps down and grabs her neck and bangs her head on the step twice. She wasn't really out yet. It's still a struggle. Then he seems to come to his senses. Oh my God, he says, and he runs for towels as she goes through the same sitting up and falling down part she did the first time. But this time, he comes back with towels, and she's still fighting him, even though he's trying to help her. He's already saying to her, or himself, you tripped. He's calling her baby, trying to soothe her. Then her seizure here is much worse. As she is flopping and taking her last breaths, it's the only close-up they use, and it is devastating. They show Michael just standing there, 
coldly watching her. Then the screen cuts to Margaret and Martha hearing the guilty verdict in court and sobbing. The next cut is to Caitlin and Martha being pulled in opposite directions as the press tries to get them on their way out. I appreciate that the girls are still very much the heart of this story. This death scene is similar to how I imagine the murder would have happened. They use every bit of the theory anyone has given, with the exception of the blowpoke, since it was disproven in court. And this still does not look premeditated. It's definitely heat of passion after Kathleen called him a lot of awful things. Unless you think about him banging her head, which only he would know about. The third scene, the now infamous owl theory, is in episode six at about the 52 minute mark, and they go with Larry Pollard's version. They show Kathleen putting out the reindeer. There are night sounds, other birds, and the owl. And then it suddenly swoops and hits her head. She falls to the ground, gets up, and it swoops and then attaches to her head. You can see her fighting it off. As she gets to the door, she's screaming, Michael, help me. She walks in the house dazed, still calling for him, but shutting the door as if to keep the owl out, leaving the blood smear we know will be found on that door later. She walks kind of blindly to the stairwell, and this time she doesn't trip. She faints at about the third step and falls backwards. Then we go through the horrific death scene again. And then this time they cut to Sophie on the phone with Caitlin. She's just told her about the owl theory and says she is humbly asking for permission to exhume her mother. Caitlin says, what the fuck is wrong with you? Now, this never happened. No one ever asked that I know of. Michael said he wouldn't have allowed it. And Sophie Brunette hotly denied it. But these three scenes are remarkable. I'm sorry to go into so much detail. I went back and forth on how much I should give you. But it felt important if you're not going to watch it. It felt important to analyze it even if you did watch it. And as critic Richard Lawson put it, what we need to see, quote, is the most bold and critical interrogation of our interest in such things. Is this what you wanted to see? he seethes in his review. Yes, it is, for me and lots of people. I told you in earlier episodes, I think there is something to these reenactments. Imagine if attorneys could film things like this for court. Which one do you choose? They all explain the blood evidence every time. But to me, the owl still makes the most sense because of the wounds on Kathleen's head, as well as the drops of blood outside and the smear on the outside door from where she came in. Detractors of the theory say, why wasn't there a more significant blood trail? I don't know that answer. I can guess because her hair was soaking it up at first until she fell in the stairwell. I said Larry Pollard's version because Titty Smith thinks that the owl held on all the way into the house. He thinks she got away from it by running or trying to run up the stairs. Then... The owl waits in the house until it's safe to fly out. Maybe once police and paramedics are crawling all over and doors are open. Smith believes there were feathers all over the crime scene, even one on Kathleen's face. I'm not so sure about this part of his theory. I don't know enough about owls to say that makes sense or not. But even though I do believe that the police and DA's office were corrupt in this case, I'm not sure I believe they actually cleaned up feathers and hid them. But think about it for yourselves. Look at his photos. Read his book. If you're like me, you want the truth, whatever it is. Let's talk about some other truths. The death scenes are honestly what made this series for me. That sounds gruesome. But I think we have talked about the possibilities of what happened to Kathleen for years. And Campos and Khan have shown us what could have happened. But what sucks is that it will be hard for anyone else to see the importance of these because they fictionalized so much else. I have talked about the Peterson family and Candace, but the original Staircase filmmakers were terribly misrepresented, and the defense team wasn't handled great either. Jean-Xavier de Lestrade is played excellently by French actor Vincent Verminian, who is black, though Jean is white. 
In an effort for diversity, several black actors are substituted. Robert Creighton plays Ron Jarrett, an old white guy who looked like an original cop on the show Law & Order in real life. Creighton is a fine actor, but his character is not developed enough, so his big scene in court when he explains his investigation into Dwayne Deaver doesn't pack the same punch that it does in the real documentary. He's certainly not the menacing man that juror claimed to see. It's a shame they wasted a good actor and such a compelling figure in the real documentary. Jean is played as a director who directs his subjects like they're actors rather than just passively recording as he actually did for the documentary. In an early scene, he even asks Michael to do a scene again with more emotion. He is shown arguing with his other producers about how guilty to make Michael look in the editing room. The real Jean was very offended by this. He said, I understand if you dramatize, but when you attack the credibility of my work, that's really not acceptable to me. David Rudolph went so far as to call the show racist and anti-Semitic for his depiction. We first meet Rudolph in a diner, spreading mustard on pastrami, talking with his mouth full, explaining how much his defense would cost and how it would work to Michael and his brother. The real Rudolph said, they may as well have hung a sign over his head that said Jew. He is a professional who met Michael Peterson for the first time in his offices. I don't blame him for being offended. Producer Allison Luchak, or Luchak, isn't even in the series. Instead, the late producer Dennis Ponset is given all the credit, and he was rarely even in America. First off, she agreed with Lestrade, quote, to malign or discredit our filmmaking by making it seem as though we were biased from the beginning is insulting and professionally damaging. And then she explained that she did not care to be in the series and she understood how characters are combined for time, but to cut out all the work of a woman, a new mother, in fact, and give it to a man who isn't even alive was insulting. She spent so much time in America first finding the Peterson case, then setting up the complicated network of relationships that it took to start filming, that when she returned home, her own son didn't recognize her. She said, I have mentored so many young female producers with the lessons I learned from making The Staircase and the demands it made on me as a new mother and a professional. So to have all my work being either erased as if it never happened or assigned to a male character is offensive. So why would they give this dynamic woman's work to an old white guy? I guess because they thought it worked better in later scenes when Ponset is fictionally arguing with the black version of Jean Xavier and more importantly, the female editor, Sophie Brunette. We can't have two women in charge, can we? And let's talk about Sophie. She is arguably the most maligned. She was in a romantic relationship with Michael, who was 17 years her senior, but not until after the film was finished and he was in prison. The series makes it look as though she falls in love with him through the tapes and wants to edit him more sympathetically. That's not true, at least according to the real Sophie. She felt sorry for Michael and horrified at his life sentence. They don't have that in France. She said it's basically a death sentence. That's why she wrote to him and they struck up a friendship that became romantic. She did stand by him, she did take care of him, and she did work on the owl theory. But it's the misrepresentation of her work as an editor that offended her. Quote, I never ever cut out anything that would be damaging for him. I have too big an opinion of my job to be even remotely tempted to do anything like that, and Jean would never let it happen anyway. She admits she was with Michael when the additional three episodes were added when he got a new trial, but they had broken up when the final two were edited. She also admits the production crew probably showed much empathy for the Peterson children, which does make it seem biased. But they had seen these young people grow up and have to deal with this incredible, horrific, life-changing experience. So they were sympathetic to Michael's side in that way. And as for the breakup, there are no hard feelings on either side. 79-year-old Michael Peterson still lives in Durham. He had intended to move to Paris and had promised Sophie he would. 
The plan had always been to live in Paris after his release. When he changed his mind, their relationship ended. He wrote in his autobiography, I don't speak French, I'm too old, I couldn't afford to live in Paris, and my children and grandchildren live here in America. But in the HBO series, it is another hateful, cold, bitter fight, reminiscent of his fight scene with his late wife, with Sophie calling him a liar and screaming that she's the editor of their relationship. They do turn her into a pathetic shrew, just like she said. So in the show and in real life, Sophie moved on. She and Jean worked together again. Michael moved in with Patty until she died and has stayed close to his children. And speaking of his children, only one has given any interviews lately and not really about the HBO series. Margaret, Margie Ratliff, has helped make a documentary called Subject. It's about the people in documentaries, the ethics of filming them, and how it changes their lives for better or for worse. Do they sign away their rights in perpetuity? Technically, yes. You are now a public figure. With Margaret and the rest, it's unfair because Michael signed for the whole family, even though the kids were all technically adults. They didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't realize it might have lifetime repercussions. Back then, documentaries were just for nerds like me to watch on a Sunday afternoon. Now they are mainstream. Or, as one of the producers of Subjects said, it's not the golden age of documentaries, it's the corporate age. Margie now has a complicated relationship to the documentary. She openly supported her father until he went on the Dr. Phil show. Then she suddenly said she felt betrayed. This was after years of giving interviews with her sister and the rest of the family. She said, quote, It was such a strong violation of myself and my family that I thought, I need to bring in cameras. I think I need to tell this from my side. She does, however, say she still believes in her father. Just, for whatever reason, this Dr. Phil show angered her. Dateline was less than two years before this, and she was still fine with discussing it then. I watched the Dr. Phil spot on YouTube and didn't really see anything, but it's not my dad up there talking to Dr. Phil, of all people, and maybe that's what pissed her off. It's like going on Nancy Grace's show after all that. I am not at all criticizing her. She makes really good points, but I agree with critics who say, you cannot pay documentary subjects without running the risk of getting a skewed narrative rather than the truth. But I do acknowledge that the truth is what the filmmaker wants it to be. Even documentaries. Even podcasts. I know. And again, yes, you do kind of sign your rights away in perpetuity. You are now in the public domain. Sophie Brunette made herself a public figure when she did an interview for a French magazine when Michael was in prison which he pressured her to do. She didn't realize that now made her a player in this real tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. True crime isn't going anywhere, even if Margie wants it, and she knows that. But she makes good points about subjects making informed decisions. She wants things like therapists on set for these projects, which is unrealistic. Most documentaries, unless they have network backing, are a couple of people and a camera. It's not a film set. But if children are involved, who makes that decision for them and how are they protected? That is a very important question. When asked about if she would watch the HBO series, she said, quote, absolutely not. I hear there's three different versions of my mom's death. I'm not going to watch that. I cannot imagine how hard this has been on all of Michael's children. The original documentary took away their privacy in a legal way that simply having been children of a murder victim would not have. I have always sought to protect the identity of children of victims and of murderers. And if their identities are well known, I still don't do a where are they now segment in the show. I didn't do it now except for Margaret, who has given recent interviews about her work. I'm not perfect. I'm sure I have made mistakes in earlier episodes, but I was always learning and always trying to be better. In my years as a podcaster, I've learned so much, but it never felt right discussing these people unless I had to because they were part of the story. But even then, afterwards, I've always felt they deserve their privacy. 
When I covered the Sheila Bellish case, I deleted many social media comments about what her grown daughters are doing today. Listeners were researching them and posting the cities they live in and the jobs they have. It's a form of doxing. And please don't try to yell at me about free speech. The First Amendment protects you from the government, not social media. I have every right to remove things I see as inappropriate, just like Facebook can remove your comments. Read the fine print. It's the world we live in. But beyond that, I implore you to remember that the children did not commit the crimes. They didn't ask to be in the public eye. If you want to search them out on your own, that's fine. But it's ghoulish to see people excitedly posting that they found the daughter of a murder victim. And that will take me to the elephant in the room. I understand intrinsically that what I do is cover the worst moments in a person's life. I am fascinated by true crime. Like I said, I always have been. But I do believe you can write about these crimes without being exploitative to the people who are left behind. I consider myself a very ethical podcaster, to the point that I didn't really want to tell you this next part, that Martha was outed in the HBO series. But now, it's out there anyway, and it is relevant to what I am talking about now. HBO didn't have to use that as a storyline. I seriously doubt this was something they mined out of the 800 hours of the staircase footage Jean Xavier sold them. What's more upsetting? They didn't appear to confirm it with Martha. They evidently said there was enough word of mouth of her being gay, so they felt enough people knew about it to put it in the show. And it is a major plot point in the series. Her queerness is connected to his. She has neither confirmed or denied her sexuality, as is her right. She hasn't spoken at all about the HBO series or anything to do with her father recently. And that is a part of the series that felt true. At the end, none of the kids came to watch him take the Alfred plea. They are living their lives. They didn't want this toxicity anymore. HBO says they don't want to be around him. Margie, in real life, sure seems a bit pissed at him, so who knows? And she is certainly pissed about the HBO series. She said she could block it on her Instagram feed, but couldn't miss it on a billboard when she was driving to work in L.A. She also said the actress Sophie Turner reached out to her to discuss her character. Margaret said she declined and pointed out that she was paid nothing for the original staircase. She gets nothing from this HBO version, but that she is sure this actor is paid handsomely. That is pretty bizarre when you think about it. Then Turner, who believes she is doing the right thing, has now sort of offended Ratliff unintentionally. When I watched Margaret Ratliff speak about how the HBO Max series re-traumatized her and her family, I immediately thought about the Jeffrey Dahmer series. When the HBO staircase came out, we got a lot of press from the documentary filmmakers, angry at the twisting of their jobs, and we got Michael lashing out at everyone. The kids stayed relatively quiet at the time. Not like when the Dahmer series premiered, and suddenly, we had a new discussion in the true crime world. There were so many questions. Do we need a fictionalized series with the handsome Evan Peters playing Dahmer when we have endless documentaries with the real monster? The families of Dahmer's victims said no. They were angry, and yes, re-traumatized. They understand the interest in the documentaries, but considered this beyond the pale. No one asked them what they thought. Certainly no one asked their permission or paid them for their story. And let's be real, both Netflix and HBO can certainly afford to pay real-life people if they wanted to, but they didn't. And no one fact-checked anything. Niecy Nash was being lauded for her performance as the neighbor the police ignored for too long. And the actress who played Rita Isabel, sister of a victim, was also being celebrated for getting the dramatic courtroom scene just right. I remember seeing side-by-side -side showings on Twitter. It was incredible, but did we need it? I cannot answer that. Like in this case, it's in the public domain, and there is a public enthusiasm for it. I will say that we know exactly what happened in the Dahmer case. He confessed. There are no lingering questions. 
there is no mystery. That's where the HBO Max series is so different. As much as I understand Margaret Ratliff's feelings, there is still a huge community arguing over whether or not he killed her mother. She is sure we are not. Antonio Campos thinks he has the answer, though. Remember what I told you to keep in your back pocket? In that last episode, they show Michael sitting down for his final interview with Jean Xavier. In one of the last scenes of the last episode, after he has broken Sophie's heart, she goes to see Jean, who shows her the tape of the last interview he did with Michael. Michael had wanted to talk. He gave his story about baseball, as he called it, about when he found out he was bisexual and his father caught him and how he dealt with his father's violence and learned to hide it. That he had to live his life that way, hiding it. Then Jean tells him he always thought there was something he was holding back in the first trial. Michael says, I was. There is. I lied about Kathleen. She never knew. I never told her about that side of me. He goes on to explain that when people first asked him if she knew, he just said, of course she did. She knew me. Like, of course she knew because of how well she knew Michael. But he didn't make that leap, he says, to actually tell her. And I'm sure I felt guilty, he says. But when you get away with something and you keep getting away with it, it becomes, oh, it's all right. You see? Michael is quietly weeping as he talks. He says, I wish I could have told her. His eyes are red. It feels like a big moment. And then Jean asks, did you kill Kathleen? And Michael answers, Kathleen's death was an accident. He didn't say no. Just like he never said yes, I told Kathleen I was bisexual. He just implied she knew. Now it's implied that whatever happened in that staircase was still an accident. Now, when I first saw this scene, I thought it was made up and was prepared for some more juicy emails from Michael Peterson denying it. But it was crickets. He can't deny it if it's true and it's on tape. And Lestrade didn't use this. He kept it out of the staircase. So maybe there is your bias. And maybe there is your truth. Can you imagine what a different documentary it would have been to end it this way? Because Campos tells the story in the behind-the-scenes clip as though it is truth. He said over coffee in 2017, Lestrade told him he filmed something explosive that would change everything, that the public would be shocked. But he didn't use it. You know what else he didn't do? Complain about this part of the series. He gave extensive interviews about how distorted his work was in the series, as though he filmed and edited The Staircase to be sympathetic to Michael intentionally. He expressed remorse for selling the rights and trusting Campos. But that was only when they were through the first five episodes. He and the rest of the team threatened to sue HBO if they didn't put up a title card before each episode saying it was fictionalized, or based on a true story, or inspired by a true story, or any of those euphemisms those who take creative license use. But he did not complain after the last episode premiered, after Campos threw him under the bus in the behind-the-scenes clip. What do you think? Do you think Michael is still somehow telling the truth? In the very last scene of the HBO series, Michael breaks the fourth wall. Colin Firth looks directly at us through the camera. The brilliance of Firth is how his eyes change, from sad to menacing to happy, even smug, and then fade to black. So that is your truth, your truth as you saw it my truth as I just analyzed it. We use these phrases all the time these days. Speak your truth. Well, what is his truth? Did Kathleen fall down the stairs? Or did she fall while they were fighting because he shoved her in anger and he still sees her death as an accident? We will never know. The Peterson case now goes in the great pantheon of American crime cases that we will never get an answer to like Jean Benet Ramsey. Truth, said Pontius Pilate. What is that? 
Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was also completely researched and written by me, although Andrea gave wonderful moral support. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by our fabulous new editor, Brandon Schecksnyder of Southern Gothic. I still mix the music and interrupt you with ads, and obviously, at least in this one, all opinions are my own. And when I say researched, I mean I spent weeks reading four books, watching and re-watching that documentary over and over, and the HBO series, watching interviews on YouTube, listening to podcasts, and reading everything else I could get my hands on about Lestrade and the other filmmakers I've discussed. And then I had to reread and rewatch a lot of it after my hiatus. Then it took forever to write, because I wasn't sure how much to reveal. In the end, I went with a big spoiler alert for you and gave you everything. I'll take this moment to apologize for the time it took to get this episode to you. You guys know I've dealt with serious health issues for a while. A wise woman told me I don't owe anyone an explanation, and she's right. But I am sorry for the delay. Oh, and hey, please take note of the new way to send cases to me. You can go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab, or just email sftcresearch at gmail.com. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fraud True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We also occasionally do book giveaways. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. Don't forget the book giveaways on Patreon and the Facebook group for the Owl Theory book I discussed, as well as the neat little Owl Theory gift I found. So if you're interested in joining either, now would be a good time. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.